Is there any other announcement that I'm missing? Anything? Anyone? Anyone? You? You? No? Okay, uh, let's pray and then we'll move on. Um, Father, thank you for letting us gather here tonight. Um, and I'm not going <laughs> to... It sounds crazy. I'm not going to lie to you, Father. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, Father, but uh, man, it feels good to have a full house, you know? It Woo! feels good to, to be in a room filled with your, with your people and to just be encouraged. And I can hear them singing out there when the band was up there singing. It just... It just you know, I'm not big on feelings, Lord, but it just felt good to hear everybody singing. And I'm so, so thankful. And I, as I sat there, I was thinking about, I don't know if this is good or bad or whatever. This is just what happened. I just want to share with everyone. I was thinking while the band was singing, oh, just how rotten I am. You know, just how rotten. I started thinking back on some of the things I've done in my life that are really, really just awful. And I'm thinking that in this world... We usually get what we earn, you know? I'm thinking about all these things. I'm not going to share them openly, but uh, I'm thinking, I don't deserve to be sitting here listening to this. I don't deserve to do what I'm doing. I don't deserve to be here with this group of people. I don't deserve to listen to beautiful music. I don't deserve to be in air conditioning. I don't deserve to be on a chair with a cushion. I don't deserve to have clothes. I don't even deserve to live. I'm here, it's insane. You are a good God. And so I'm just so very thankful that you love me the privilege of being here with these beautiful people. Lord, we ask your blessing on angel. We ask your blessing on holy, way off across the other side of the earth, Lord. Neither one of them have it like we do. But Lord, they got you. They do have a daddy. And you care for them. You care for them so much that you brought them to Revolution Church so that you could take care of them through us. You are a good daddy. And we thank you for that. <coughs> we thank you also for all these other kids that are in our building right here, right now. In all three rooms, all these kids, Lord. I'm so thankful for them. We are. They are blessings. We pray, Lord, that you will help us as a church to pour into them the gospel, to pour into them the love of God, to pour into them the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they might come to know him and love him and serve him for a lifetime. Lord, I thank you for that. <clears throat> I thank you for this amazing, amazing group of musicians that just bless us every single week. It is a gift from you, Lord. And we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Who is the gospel for? What is man's condition without the gospel? And what is man's fate without the gospel? Why do we need the gospel? The gospel is a great mystery to many. In his book to the Romans, the great apostle Paul provides clear answers to all of man's questions about God, and about himself. Welcome to the HD Gospel. I don't know if that was a, um, a cool video or if it was that I needed a chance to breathe. <clears throat> I'm not going to lie to you, this book, the book of Romans, it scares the poop out of me. It does. I mean, it is. It is so rich with theology. It is such an amazing book. But it's funny, even though it's amazing and so full with good stuff, <clears throat> it is like maybe only second to Revelation that people fight about it. It is the battleground for Christians. I don't understand that. But after reading through this thing a bunch of times over the last couple of weeks, I, it's starting to to come to me as to why, because all this, it was challenging everything that, I was fighting with myself. I was fighting with myself about this book, and I'm, I'm trying desperately to understand what Paul is finding here. It's not easy. It's not easy. I want to start by saying this. You, you have a Bible, right? Does anyone in this room not own one? Because we'll give you one. Because you have a Bible. So I'm going to start by saying this. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. My interpretation of the Bible 
is not truth. The Bible is truth. Okay? I'm not God. I'm not the Bible. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Holy Spirit. The, the Bible is truth. And since we're the people and He is God, it is our obligation to seek the truth and live under it the very best that we can. But there's not a man on earth that has the market cornered on the book of Romans. No one does. We study, we pray, we study, we pray, we study, we pray. We look up on Google, we read commentaries, we study, then we pray some more. And we know that when we go in, we're going to make mistakes, but we're going to try the best we can. I'm going to offer up to you for months and months what I believe is the truth of God's word as found in the book of Romans. But you, my friends, are, have an obligation on your own. You have to be an active participant in your learning experience. I am not to spoon feed you. You are to learn on your own. And so if you have a Bible or if you have a, an electronic device, whatever it is, that we are so lazy. This thing reads the Bible to me now. I can press a button and it reads to me. So there's no excuse anymore. Even if you drive two hours to and from work, even better, it can read to you. So you have an obligation to, if you live out in the outback in Australia and no one's ever brought you a Bible, you're kind of off the hook on reading it. You don't have that privilege. Do you understand that? You're in America. You have the privilege of a Bible. And so you need to read this thing and you need to understand what it's saying. You've got to make choices on your own. This, this book, you know when you're a kid, <laughs> do you remember when there was the monsters under your bed? Yeah, like you knew they were there, right? You knew that they were there, and mom and dad would turn the lights off, and you knew that those monsters were there, and you're just laying in bed like this. And you knew. But you didn't dare look under that bed, because if you didn't look under the bed, you didn't give it life. It wouldn't come up out of the bed. The sharks were only around the bed. They weren't up in the bed, right? So you didn't want to look under the bed because you knew if you looked at it, you gave it life. And that's what this book does to me. It scares me. I've wanted to, to, to preach through this book for years. Years I've wanted to preach through, but I'm afraid. I'm being honest with you, I was afraid. And so several weeks ago, I just felt, feel it like stir it up in me again, like you're going to preach through Romans. You're going to preach through Romans. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. But then I started reading it again, and I was like, can I change my mind? No, pump. You know, the beautiful thing about preaching through books of the Bible is that it makes you preach things you don't want to preach about. So you're not just a topical guy. If you're a topical guy, you can kind of stick and move. You can shuck and jive. You can avoid stuff. But you can't when you do it this way. So, um, you know, news me if, if you don't like what I said. Here's the thing. Um, on Sunday nights, we do round table, right? Churches don't generally do that. They're not open for discussion. That's the law. Thus saith the Lord, right? <laughs> my, my, what is it? What was it? Uh, my discourse for today, uh, now I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to give you the best that I got. But on Sunday night, we get together in that lounge back there, and we talk about stuff. We talk about what we talked about. Now, I know that when you leave here every week, you have questions and you have concerns, and sometimes you think I'm crazy and go, he's totally wrong. That's totally cool. You have the right to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I didn't have anything else I was going anywhere. You can come on Sunday night. We can talk about it. So if you, we're going to get to some heavy stuff. You these questions. Who's the gospel for? What's our condition before it, before we even receive it? Why do we have it? What's our condition afterwards? I mean, look at who gets saved. Or I mean, like, there's a lot of heavy stuff in here, and we're going to fight about it. There's going to be times probably over the next six, eight months while we're going through this that I'm going to actually stop and ask you to break up and start praying and ask God for the answer because I don't know it. I already have them. I already know them. I already know where I'm going to do that because I have no idea what that says. It makes no sense to me. And, and we need to come together and we need to ask Him. And the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, right? So we're going to ask Him. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy, but I'm looking forward to it. But just, give, here's the thing. Give me some grace, right? Give me some grace. I'm not that smart. I barely graduated high school. I don't even know why you guys are here. What's wrong with you people? The guy across the street just
just got like a, a, a doctorate in theology. What are you doing here? No way. I don't get it. I don't get it. So let, let me let me just let me start here. Um, the reason why the reason why that we're studying this gospel. It, it's amazing how God works things out. Get ready to do this, right? I, you know, some of you know I work at uh, in my community at the, at the Groves Gym. There's a there's a there's a gym there. You know, the, the Groves of Bay. We have a gym. It's like a basketball and volleyball and weight room and stuff like that. Obviously, I've been hit with weights. Um, but uh, uh, so we, we, so I work there three days a week, right? So one day a couple weeks ago, as I was preparing in this, um, you guys, some of you know Judd, right? So he's a Sunday guy. Uh, so Judd and I were down at the gym and we're talking and. Uh, and, and, and we get done, it's 5 o'clock, and so we're walking back to the house, right? And there's a kid in our neighborhood that is uh, getting ready to go into the Marines, okay? And uh, he pulls up, and I know him, and Judd knows him well. And, and listen, this is not the part of the sermon where I express my opinion that, you know, war is bad and guns are bad. And I believe that we should turn the other cheek, and Jesus said we should... Pray for our enemies, and if they're hungry, give them some to eat. If they're thirsty, give them some to drink. Like I don't feel that <laughs> by any means, but Jesus said that, so that's what I believe. So, but uh, that's not the point of this. The point is, is that this a future Marine comes driving up on us, and he gets out of the car. We're talking, and he's telling us that he's getting ready to go into the Marines, and and so we start. And of course, I just give him a complete Bible thrashing because that's just the nice guy that I am, and uh, and Judd is a lot nicer. And he's a lot uh, more, he's an assassin with his words because he quietly decapitates you, right? And so, um, so, so he goes and, and we're talking and, and, and so Judd looks at the kid and goes, Hey, um, are you familiar with the oath that you're to take as uh, someone in the armed services? And, and he's like, yes. Uh, let me, do you guys mind if I read it? It's just short. Just let me read it. It's um, I blank, name it. Uh, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear the true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to regulations in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. That's it, right? So he says, he says hey, hey, buddy, do you, do you know the oath that you have to take? And he's like, yeah, I do. And he looks at me and goes, um, okay. Have you ever read the Constitution? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. No. Wait, wait, wait a minute, hold on. So, and I'm not, I'm ripping this all over, okay? But, wait, so you're telling me that you're willing to die or kill someone who objects to your belief system, your Constitution, yet you've never even read it. So, what are you, what are you fighting for? I, and I'm not saying now what's, who's right or wrong here. I'm just saying it, if it's life or death, right, don't you think you should know what it is, right? I would think that if you're going to actually kill someone or, or maybe possibly be killed, like end your life, that's a biggie, right? If you're going to end your life, it should be something that you at least understand. Would you agree? Like, I'm going to read the Constitution if I'm, going to will, if I'm willing to take a bullet and die for it. I want to know what it is. And it's the same thing with the gospel. It is life or death that we're talking about here. We're talking about life or death, but not just, it's beyond the Marines, it's beyond the Navy. It's not just death in this lifetime, it's death forever, right? It's death or life forever. So it is a life or death situation. So if the Bible tells us that we're to like share the gospel, you know, uh, Acts 1.8, Jesus says, You will be my witnesses uh, here in Jerusalem, to Samaria, to Judea, and to the ends of the earth. You know, go share this news with everybody. And then he says in the Great Commission, right? He says, go. Go make disciples of all nations, right? Teach them all that I do. Like, he tells us to share the gospel, right? He also tells us in the Bible that we're to, to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, you do that if you don't even know what it is? Right? How can we share the gospel and live a life that's worthy of the gospel if we don't even know what the 
true gospel is. Would you agree with me? Church universal. I'm not talking about every single church that you've ever been to, but just the, the, the foundation, the, the church of Jesus Christ. Would you agree that, that, the, that the functioning of his church universal and the very existence of the church revolves around the gospel, right? That's everything. That's everything. Everything we do revolves around those two words, the gospel. What is the gospel? What is it for? Why do we need it? We have to define it in detail. We have to apply it to our life. Is the gospel just, I suck, Jesus doesn't, he died on the cross, I get heaven? Because really that's kind of what a lot of people think. If you ask the everyday 70 percenter here in this country that says that they're Christian, tell me what the gospel is. I, I bet you get some version of what I just shared with you. They wouldn't be able to really tell you what it is. There's so much more to the gospel than what most people know. And so the reason why we're calling it the HD Gospel is because we want to we want to explain and examine the gospel in high definition. Absolute clarity so that you understand. See, you can't be a Christian unless you understand what a Christian is. You can't follow Christ unless you know who Jesus is. You need to have some answers. I know that every single person in this room has questions. And they have, they're looking for answers when it comes to God and his word. Uh, let's take a second before we dive into it. Let's just kind of talk a little bit about the book. Uh, the book was written by the amazing man, uh, the Apostle Paul. Okay, This guy was incredible. This guy is the Jew of Jews. He kept the law perfectly. He was trained for years in the scriptures. He knew the Jewish faith like the back of his hand. Okay, And then one day, instead of killing him, which, you know, all of us would probably go, yeah, he should have wiped out Paul because he was killing Christians. He deserved it. That's, that's our mentality most of the time. He deserved to be, to be killed, but Jesus doesn't kill him. That's an example for us, okay? He doesn't kill him. What does he do? He saves him. He's like, okay, Paul, that same energy you used to try to crush me, I'm going to use it so people will praise me, okay? So I'm going to use you to build my church, okay? Now, the church in Rome, he had never been there. He had heard about them, but he had never been there, and his desire was to go there and to bless them. We're going to read a little bit more about that in the book of Romans. History tells us that, that at Pentecost, you can read about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, okay, Jews from all across the land would come into Israel, and they would celebrate this holiday, and then they went back, and when they went back, these Jewish people went as Christians back to Rome and planted a church. Jews in a highly populated Gentile area. Okay, Roman Empire was not really Jewish and Christian friendly, if you guys don't know that. Okay, so they go back and they plant a church in the... Rome, you guys remember Rome, they're the ones who killed Jesus, right? You, you know that. So that takes some, some real backbone to start a church of Jesus Christ in the middle of the Death Star. Right? That's kind of tough. And that's what they did. So here's this area. They've got Jews and they've got Gentiles. The Jews that know the law and the, the Gentiles that don't know anything about this God. And they come together and they start a church. And that's who Paul was writing to. He was in Corinth, which is southern Greece. And he, was, he had collected this generous offering from these poor people, these poor Gentiles in Greece. He was collecting it for their new Christian brothers who were Jews, now Christians, back in Jerusalem. So you can see what the Gospels are the beginning to do. It's bringing, it has the power not to just save, but to reconcile different groups of people. We've got Jews and Gentiles who didn't like each other, but the Gospel of Jesus Christ is beginning to bring them together. And it's seen, it's fleshed out with this offering them, not only Gentiles, but broke, who can relate, broke, and they still gave generously, the Bible said, and Paul was going to take this offering to the believers in Jerusalem, and then his plan was to, if he was from Boston, he was going to bang a UE, 
He was going to bang Huey, and he was going to go to the left over here to Spain. And along the way, he was going to stop in Rome. But in the meantime, he writes them a letter. He writes them a letter. And so there is the backdrop for the book of Romans. Now, what the book of Romans does is it explains, it clarifies the gospel. But before we do this, I think it's very smart if we would uh, examine some of the things that, that exist in our world here today, in our culture, these false gospels. And I just want to touch two of them. We've touched on these a little bit in the past, but it's, it's good to remember so we can sniff out uh, the false gospel. Here's the first one, and Paul is just going to blow it out of the water in this book. But it, the first gospel, the false, false, first false gospel is that, that the gospel is just too easy. This guy just died for you, and that's it. So, so it's just too easy, so I'll, I'll help God out. I'll, I'll keep the laws, too. Because what Jesus did isn't enough. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that we get circumcised. I'll make sure that we don't eat cheeseburgers. I never could get that one. And I'll make sure we don't eat shellfish. And I'll make sure we, we have certain days that are holier than others. We wear certain clothing. We say certain prayers. We do certain things. And then if we don't do those things, we'll make sure we sacrifice certain animals. And, if we, and then if our kids misbehave, we'll make sure we stone them. Amen, right? I can't stone them. Yeah. Some people are like, yeah, Old Testament. Yeah. you got to help God out. But you're going to see that Paul just blows this thing out of the water. Now, the other one is not that I'm going to keep the law. See, the law, is, generally speaking, now, I don't know if you've ever met someone who insists on keeping all the laws also. Like, they say yes to Jesus, but you've got to keep all the laws. They usually don't smile a lot. You ever see those people? They don't smile a lot. But here's the, here's the next group of people that have another false gospel. These guys smile all the time. Right? Because it's, it's Jesus is, is good, but I'm going to be gooder. And if I'm good and I do nice things and I'm generous and kind and nice and fuzzy and happy like buddies, I will go to heaven. Are you going to go to heaven? Well, I think so, because I'm a good guy. No, you're not. You're wretched. <laughs> How about that? No, no one's good enough. But that's what they think. So it's all like, oh, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. Well, that's not going to work either. I'm going to start here. Wanna, let's do this. Let's open our, our Bibles to the book of Romans. Uh, please put your eyes in front of God's word. Don't ever take my word for this. Please. Um, open up to the, the book of Romans right here in the first chapter. I'm just going to read the first like seven verses. We'll start We'll start here. And if you, uh, if you want to borrow one of the, or if you want to have one of the Bibles that are here, the page should be up there somewhere. Of course, it's not. It's awesome. They won't, they won't show up. Hello. I'm trying. Almost the very last thing he says. 
This message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God. So he's, it's, like book, it's like bookends, isn't it? He said the same exact thing twice. At the beginning he says, this is what I'm going to do. Then he does it. And then he says, this is what we just did. He, he wants to make a point. See, the true gospel really honestly has two components. It, it's not just to believe that Jesus is God. It's not just to believe that Jesus is God. Okay, only, if you read this, these two things, only believe and obey brings glory to God. Both ingredients are required. Now let me, before people, the grace people start shooting BBs at me, I want to tell you something, okay? The book of James says this in James 2.19, that the demons, even Satan's voice, they believe. But without obedient action, that belief is worthless. Do you understand? So just believe in it that Jesus is God, that doesn't get it done. And it also doesn't mean that just doing, 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 doing to try to get his good graces, that isn't going to get it done either. See, Isaiah has something to say about that. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, that our righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. So left to itself, just keeping the law or being good, it's nothing. Both components must be present. That is what brings glory to God. To just sit back. Sin after sin. Willful rebellion. But acknowledging, well, yeah, Jesus is God. He went to the cross to pay for my sin. I, I, listen, I, I think that that guy's going to be one of those guys that says, but Lord, Lord, I, I did this. And he's going to go, who are you? You just completely disobeyed me the whole time. See? So Oh, so you wanted to consider me your Savior, but you sure, certainly didn't want to consider me your Lord. Because I said jump, and you didn't. I said speak, and you didn't. I said don't, and you did. You never listened to anything that I said. But it's different now. And I struggled with this, and I didn't really unpack this until today. How do you tell people that it's not Jesus plus keeping the law, or Jesus and like, that's not right, but yet believe and obey is, because isn't that kind of the same thing? See, the Old Testament was, here's a rule. It's the letter of the law, and you must keep it, or else. Keeping these laws also identified you as one of God's people. Being circumcised identified you physically as one of God's people. Do you understand? But the Bible in the New Testament says now that we can worship Him not by the letter of the law, but by the Spirit. So it's not you have to do this, 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 and this in this way, on this day, in this fashion. No, it's love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, keep the whole law of Christ. Be generous. Have compassion. Do you see any specifics here? I don't see a lot of specifics. You know why? His Spirit's trying to lead you. And when you're loving God with everything that you are, and you're loving people, do you really have to wor worry about the laws? Because when you're following God's Spirit, and you're loving Him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and you're sharing each other's burdens, and you're praying for everybody, and you're giving generous... You're following God, man. You don't need the law to show you what to do anymore. You're in, the, you're in the sweet spot of God's grace. That's what he's looking for. So believing and obeying is what we're looking for, not by the letter of the law, but by the Spirit. I'm going to direct you to Ephesians chapter 2. Would you go there with me, please? I'm going to take a swing. Is it doing good and keeping the law that gets us saved? See, a lot of people think that. Like, the common answer, if you've done any evangelism, when you knock on the door and you ask them, if you die, you're going to go to heaven, they go, well, I think so, because I'm a good person. That's awesome that you're a good person. But does that get you into God's graces that you're good? Well, 
The Bible is very, very clear. We need to know what I'm about to share with you to truly understand our condition outside of the gospel. You need to know this. And it's important to, to have this as part of your artillery. It's part of your, 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 um, it's your weapon. It's your weapon to understand so you can have peace, okay? Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It talks about doing good things. Verse 8 and 8 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So it's not, a, it's not a reward for something that you've done in the past already, but it doesn't mean we, not, we don't do them. It says, it's not a, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done in the past, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So it's not the good deeds that get you saved, but it's the fact that you got saved so that you can go do the good deeds. Do you get that? Okay, so so once, you, once you get saved, it's not like, well, I can just keep on sinning like crazy because my sins, past, present, and future are forgiven, so I'm good. And I can still be the same person that I was because God's grace is upon me. No, he saved you to change you so you can start doing some really good things for him. So there's, listen, there, there absolutely must be change in someone. I'm telling you right now. If Jesus Christ himself in this flesh sat down in that chair right now, would it impact you? Of it would freak you out, right? So if you, that's the problem I think that we have. We don't understand the reality that Jesus Christ is sitting there right now. And when we come and we have an encounter with the living Christ, it should change you completely. You should never be the same person you were. Never. And if you haven't changed, you need to tell people who say, people don't change, tell them to get out of your face. People change. Okay, people change. I'm watching it here in this church. I see people change. So I know that it works. I know God is at work. He is changing people. And when you have an encounter with the living God, it changes people. It changes people. Okay, so now listen, you're not supposed to get rid of you're not supposed to just get rid of, of, of all thought of, you know, like, oh, I'm just, I'm going to be perfect. Like, you don't get rid of that. You don't focus that I'm going to be perfect. You, you don't, you don't do anything except to do this. You fix your eyes on Jesus, right? Fix your eyes on Jesus, and he changes you. Like, you don't have to try. I hear it all the time, and I, I'm guilty of it too. Well, I'm going to try doing this, and I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing that. Like, you don't have to do anything except this. Fix your eyes on Christ. Do you ever notice that you go, when you, if you're looking, you're driving, you look, what do you do? Right? If you're driving down the road and you see a pretty girl, come on guys, you don't leave me out here. <laughs> you're a liar. <laughs> My wife's not in here. Look at this here in the text, verse 2. 
Um, God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures referring to the Old Testament. These New Testament books haven't been um, prepared and put together into what we call the Bible now, the canon of Scripture, 66 books. So referring back to the Old Testament. And so you remember that this Paul is writing to a church that had some Jewish people in it. So for them to fully understand this Jesus, he wants them to understand, like, I'm connecting with you Jewish people. I am Jewish. This is not something new like we're coming up with. Hey, we got a new thing. No, 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 no. Listen, it's not a new thing. You guys have been waiting for this. Let me refresh your memory. So he brings them back a little bit, okay? He's catering to the Jews by connecting the gospel with the Old Testament. So look, look here, uh, Daniel 25, it talks about this anointed one. This anointed one, of uh, the Hebrew actually said that this Messiah would come. Uh, and that's Old Testament prophecy. Verse 26 of chapter 9, it says that this Messiah will seem to die accomplishing nothing. Right? Now, now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if he's a, a Messiah, a deliverer, a king, a, an authority that's going to be a, a, a world changer, it doesn't make any sense what happened to him. You remember? He, he's, he's doing all these miracles and he's got these crowds are gathering and he's healing all these people and mass producing food and all this casting out of demons and raising dead people and the crowds are growing and all of a sudden he's dead on a cross. And, and if you read the Bible says that Peter and, and the guys, they just kind of gave up. And Peter's like, hey guys, I guess we should just go back to fishing. Let's just go fishing. Because that's what they were. You guys are like, yeah, let's do it. Right? Hey, let's go fishing. <laughs> they gave up. Because this, this amazing Messiah, everyone was like, yeah, Jesus, woo, woo And then he's died. He dies. It was a good one. It was a good run while it lasted. But see, the scripture says that that's actually good. Because that'll let you know, yeah, that's the God. It seemed that he died accomplishing nothing. It also says in Daniel chapter 26 that the temple and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And so in AD 70, the same Rome that killed Jesus, that fulfilled this, Prophecy, they also, in the year 70, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. Can I give you some more? Yeah. Any other Bible geeks out there? You ready? Isaiah 9. The page should be up there. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Paul's like, this isn't new news. This is old news. This uh, 800 years ago, guys, all you Jewish folks, I just want to reinforce your belief system here because this was prophesied by your Bible. Uh, chapter 9, verse 6, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. That's eternity. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. I don't know about you, but regular earthly fleshy kings, they're not called mighty God. Okay, Jewish people, let, listen, other cultures did that of their, of their fake gods. But Jewish people, they, they, they don't call someone mighty God unless he's what? Mighty God, right? They didn't, they didn't say it to, to rock sculptures and wooden, can I, you know, totem poles and stuff. They didn't do that. Jewish people call mighty God, mighty God. Not, not somebody else. So they knew he was coming. Uh, Isaiah 53. Never gets old, Mark. Isaiah 53, verse 2 through 11. I'm just going to start reading it. Catch me. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. 
And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and, a sh and as a sheep is, is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he had died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. This is old news. It's old news. The Jewish people knew that a Messiah was coming, and Paul wanted to point, remind them of this and then point to that Jesus. Verse, chapter 1, verse 3, this good news, this Messiah is about the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what he says in Romans 1, 3. The Jews knew that the Messiah was coming. The Gentiles knew nothing of this Messiah. As a matter of fact, in, in chapter 9, verse 30, it says that the Gentiles weren't even trying to follow God's standards. And so this is where the book of Romans takes place in this context. Jews and Gentiles. They know the law, they know Messiah is coming, and all of a sudden, here's all these Gentiles in Rome, and they have no clue of this Messiah. They just heard something cool, and they wanted to be a part of it. And they didn't even really know the meat behind the gospel. One of Paul's greatest challenges you're going to see throughout this book, you're going to see him face and try to overcome this thing, is, is trying to establish real Christian faith in a community that held a plurality of religions. There was a lot of religions there. And Paul is trying to rope it all in so any false gospels are dispelled and the real true gospel would be known to all the people there in Rome. And that's what he wants for us right here. And that's why we're going to study the book of Romans. We'll look here, uh, go back to the text, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Paul says that he... he He's preaching the good news, and he says, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. You see, he said, the, the, the other gospels that you may have heard, they don't have the power to save. This gospel, this Jesus Christ, this good news, this one has the power to save to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So he's saying this is the power of God and it and it alone has the power to save all people because it was either Jews and then everyone else in the world is what? A Gentile. And so he says this gospel has the power to save all people. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. That is massive importance right there. You can't just go by that. That it starts and finishes. That means every single thing about the gospel and your salvation is about faith. And he digs in a little deeper here for those that think that their good deeds get them somewhere. And he says this, it is by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Now, you might read that the way you want, but let me tell you how I read that. When I read that statement, he's saying righteous people. These are the people that, that do good. They think they do good. They do good. They do lots of good stuff. I'm a righteous guy. I'm a righteous gal. But he's like, yeah, listen, even for that person that, that thinks that they're good, that's not how it works. That's not going to get you in. Even the do-gooder gets in through faith. It doesn't matter how good you are, it's only through faith that you get in and 
to stay in. Only by faith. And now, here, at this point, after verse 17, is where Paul viciously attacks false gospels. And we're gonna we're gonna like we're gonna go like heavy, deep electron microscope into this stuff over the next handful of months. But we're not gonna do that tonight. Okay? We're not gonna do that tonight. Th this is what we gotta do tonight. This is the last thing we're gonna do tonight. Okay? We gotta go here. Revolution Church. Why are we studying the book of Rome? Why 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 do we study anything ever? Why, why do we gather? Why do we ever even gather? Why, why, why do we gather and sing songs together and do stuff? To, like, why, why are we even doing this? You know, that's the question that we have to ask ourselves as a family. And I think that Paul gives us clarity here as to why we should be doing it. Now, now why you should be doing it and why you're doing it may be two totally different things. But listen, it's in the Bible for a reason, to tell us why we should be gathering together and studying the scriptures and praying and singing and all. Why do we do this? See, here's, here's, the, here's, here's what happens a lot. Let me tell you. Anyone in here, and, and you should be proud right now, because now's the time to get to show off. Anyone in here ever invite a friend to this church? Go ahead. Let's raise your hand. Yeah, right? We invite people, right? Awesome. And, and, and let me ask you this. Have you ever heard this response? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to come by and check out your church. Did you ever hear that one? They come by to check out your church. Why? Why do I come by and check out your church? See, they like it, right? Who cares if they like it? That's not going to be, like, if you went to a church growing conference, that wouldn't be the thing that people would say, right? Who cares if people like your church? See, the mentality is, I'm going to come by and check out your church and see if it suits me, okay? Let's just Let's, can we read something together? God's word, you ready? Let, let's pick up where we left off over here. Um, no, no, sorry, no, no, let's just jump back. Let's jump back. Uh, verse, verse 8. 8 through 15, let's read this. Let me say first that, yeah, we did leave off there. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you Day and night, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about His Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For a, a, for a long, I'm sorry, for I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to be encouraged by your faith but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I'm eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the good news. Let's just break that down a little bit. Why? Why do we gather? Why do we come to church? So I think a lot of people have a bad attitude about it. I'm going to come check out your church. Some people have come. And they don't like it. You know we have over 500 likes on our Facebook page. Right? You don't see 500 people here, do you? Apparently... Let's be fair, I mean, there's some people that live out of state, out of the area, but the majority of them live here, but you don't see them coming here, right? They might not like what they see. It's okay. But we're here, right? We're here right now. And, and you're, I'm going to curse you right now because I'm going to give you the truth. And you, you're, you're obligated to it now, right? Here we go. What's Paul's example of why we come together, why we come to church? It's never, ever about him. Never ever is about him. Uh, look in verse 8 and 11. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. Verse 11. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. So why does Paul want to go to this church in Rome? 
Does he want to go check it out to see if it's all that would work for him? It's all about faith and a growing faith for the other people. Why is he going to church? To check it out to see if it flies for him? See if the music is good? See if they have the children's ministry for his kids? What is it? What is it? He wants to see their faith grow. He wants to give, he wants to come not to receive something, right? But to give something of himself so that other people can have their faith grow. To strengthen them in the Lord. It's so that other people's faith would grow. Also, it's about love. Love. Let's not go to the church and see if I like it. Not to see if they love me when I walk in the door. Will they greet me? Will they hug me? Will they welcome me? Will they pour my coffee for me? No, 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 no. Go to the church. You know why? So you can love other people, right? So you can love other people. Look at verse 9. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God. Think about that. Of all the gifts you've ever received in your entire life, what could be better than me, like, engaging the creator of the universe on your behalf? Could, could any Xbox or any car or any cash gift card or whatever be anything better than that? Day and night I'm engaging the creator of the heavens and earth on your behalf. He loves those people. And he relentlessly prays on their behalf. It's to bring love to other people. That's why we should gather. It's also so that we could serve. Again, verse 9 and 11, it's used... Same way, look at verse 9. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart. How does Paul serve? By spreading the good news about his son to whoever would listen. Look at verse 15. What does it say? I am eager to come to you in Rome too. Why? To preach the good news. He knows that when he goes to the church, it's not so he can sit in a seat and be fed. Stay, right? It's so he could feed other people. He is not coming into the church to sit and consume. He is there to, to serve. He did not come to be served. He comes to serve, just like the Lord he follows. I came not to be served, but to serve others. Verse 13, it's to evangelize. It's to evangelize. What does he say? I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to just come in and sing some songs and say some prayers and go home. Have a great week. God bless you. No, 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 no. He wants to see spiritual fruit in you. See, that's the motivation of a true Christian who comes to gather in the church. It's not to receive something for yourself. It's to give of yourself so someone else could receive. You know, if you were just here to bless everybody else, and everyone else was here to bless you, this place would be rocking all the time. It would be rocking. It's always about the other people. It's never supposed to be about you. You don't come to church because it's a church that you like. You come to this church to bless the people that are here. So they would get to know Jesus in a greater way. It's supposed to go both ways. You see what Paul says? He says in verse 12, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. You see, we work together. Don't neglect meeting together to encourage each other to love and good deeds. Get together, motivate one another, stir it up a little bit, stir up the faith. Bring your gifts to the church and bless the people in the name of Jesus. Paul is an awesome leader. And so this speaks to all people that are in church leadership or whoever aspire to be in church leadership. Paul is an amazing leader and it's on display here. He's an awesome leader. Day and night he's praying for these people. I don't. I need to. That's why it's in there. He's longing to serve them. Think about that. Does that fly in the face of the culture that we live in? Longing to come and be your slave. Who does this? 
Who does this? This man's amazing. And he says that he hopes to, speak, to see spiritual growth in these people. To serve and not to be served. And the very last thing, and I, wanna, I, I just want to stress this, and then we're going to... We're going to pray and we're going to take communion together, but I want to say this about Paul. He displays amazing humility. And I want, this is the last thing I want to say, and I'm done. Look back in verse 5, chapter 1. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them. The ability to come and like to do this, or to even share the gospel with anybody, it's a privilege. It's not a burden. And I think one of the reasons why the gospel hasn't spread throughout the world like it should is because our attitudes about sharing it and serving come yuck. Our honesty is kind of yucky. We wouldn't dare. Truth be known, we would not dare blow off our job today. Not in today's economy, we wouldn't. I, I'm not talking about someone who's a wreck. I'm talking about an everyday, well-adjusted man or woman. You would not blow off your job just no show, no call. Never. Right? You gotta, get, you gotta make that money. You gotta make that money. People blow off church attendance and drop it like out as soon as something comes your way. All the time. Things of God are the most important things. And to be able to come and share your faith and share the stories in your life that God's doing in your life with someone else who's sitting here right now to encourage their faith, that's way more important than your job. Do you know that? Because these are the things that are eternal. They're not temporal things. These are eternity. These are forever. Let me tell you something. It's in there for a reason. The word privilege, because it is. It's a pri I, when I sat there and listened to this music, and I'm thinking, man, I did this, and I did that, and I did this. You know what I deserve? Jail and death. And I'm sitting up here on a cushy chair listening to the, 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 the nice band singing songs in this beautiful place, and I get to sit here and share the most important, precious words ever known to the human race. This is what I get to do? I didn't deserve this. I don't deserve this, God. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to do this. I can't beat you in the head with it. You just got to let the Holy Spirit convince you of these things. But it's a privilege to be able to come here and share your faith and your testimony and your resources with the, with the family that God has brought together for you. Okay? It's light. In the coming weeks and months, we're going to get into it deep. And I just want to challenge you all, please, from right here, we're going to get off the hook. From right here, all the way around. You're off the hook, too. Gotcha, Joey. Be here every single week. Be here every single week. I challenge you. I'm calling you out, and I'm challenging you once and for all. Be here every single week. And, and look, it's not to make me happy. It's to make everybody else happy. It's making him happy. Good point. It's because you're important here. You're part of a family of believers. And all of us need to hear your stories. We all need to be encouraged by one another. How many people have cried in the arms of someone else in this church? How many people have heard an encouraging story by someone in this church that built their faith? How many people have heard a song that made their faith explode? What are you doing not coming? This is my, this is my, this is my hot spot. You know that? This is important. It's important. I, I, let's do this once in a while. You know what I mean? Let's get it on. I'm proud of you guys. Um, Lord, I thank you for letting us gather here today. I thank you, Lord, for this. I thank you for even thinking of us as worthy of knowing the real gospel that saves. I thank you, Lord, that we 
We don't need to guess anymore. We don't need to wonder because you are going to break it down verse by verse, word for word, and you're going to share with us what it really means to embrace you through your son, Jesus Christ, for an eternity in your presence. That we don't have to try to figure out how to do it anymore. You are so kind, you're going to let us know. I thank you, Lord, for every person in this room that, like me, a wretched sinner who sat and, and pondered some of the things that I've done in my life and, and began to think of the things that I deserve. See, when I work, I deserve my pay. And my work has been filthy and awful, yet you are so kind. You don't give me what I deserve. Lord, for all those people in this world that say, how could there be a God when all this bad happens? Lord, let me be one who says, thank you, Lord, that you are there, that you didn't give me what I deserved. Thank you for that. And I know I speak for many people in this room. We feel the same way. Many of us, if not all of us, feel the same way, that we have not been given what we deserve. And we're forever thankful for that. Thank you for every person here. Thank you for the privilege of even being here with you and your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.